Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us today for this latest episode of the Digital Trials Podcast. I am very excited today to be joined by someone I've had the privilege of knowing for a while, someone who is a global leader in data management, not just at a pharma company, but also in a very, very significant industry body, which we will explore at length. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Patrick Nadolny. Thank so you. Patrick, first of all, thank you very much for taking time to join us today. My pleasure. Here in uh, very sunny Madrid. It's very sunny Madrid, actually. It's very warm. <laughs> so uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, forgive any uh, beads of sweat as we go through the questions. Hopefully I won't put you under too much pressure. <laughs> Hopefully and likewise. Not. But thank you for taking time today. Um, today we're going to try and, I suspect, have a quite lively discussion on the concept of clinical innovation in a non-EDC-centric world. Yep. I think I'm very interested today to kind of understand your and potentially Sanofi's view to the future of clinical trials mm -hmm. and where we're going. But perhaps before I join in or jump into that, could I ask you to introduce yourself more fully for anyone out there who might not be as familiar with you as I am? Thank you. Yes, and my name is Patrick Nadolny. I'm the Global Head of Clinical Data Management at Sanofi. So I have been in the industry for over 30 years right now. So I have been uh, leading transformation for quite a while, actually. I think you trapped me by about one year in the industry, I think we discovered yesterday. So, uh, mm -hmm. so that's good. And could you also just introduce maybe your role at SCDM? I want to hold that back and we'll talk about it in depth. But as the acting or serving vice chair this year and no, full yeah. chair next year, uh, yes, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I am the vice chair of the board at uh, the Society for Clinical Data Management, which helps transforming the uh, CDM industry. So, but uh, on the last five years, I would say since 2018, I was primarily the uh, chair of the Innovation Committee on Help SCDM, uh, paving the way of a new world of clinical data management. I'm sure we're going to talk about it. Oh, we're absolutely going to talk about it. Maybe we, we, we talk a little bit about your work and Sanofi first, but let's take that, that word and talk about transforming data management. Mm -hmm. It's a highly discussed concept, transitioning from data management to data science, transforming data management, patient centricity. There's a whole host of goals that seem to be banded around, maybe overly discussed, perhaps. What does it mean to you and what does it mean to Sanofi? Uh, it means a lot. Uh, in some extent, you're right, the term is overused. The term transformation could mean everything and anything. But I think we have to acknowledge we are at an industry inflection point today. I think we're going to see transformation on the D CDM space a lot more than we have seen in the past. The transition from paper to DC was one step. It's much bigger. It's really meaning uh, transforming the data flow. We are going to be we are actually inundated with new types of data at a large scale, uh, medical imaging, uh, genomics, uh, labs, etc. So I think pretty large number of data uh, sources, sensor, wearable, you name it. And we have to change the way we manage that data. And it's not just about the way we manage the data, it's also about how do we extract the value from that data. In the past, it was simply getting data in EDC, running ED checks, but now it's more complicated than that. The regulation have changed. It's applying a risk-based methodology. So it's really changing the way we look at data. We also have to consider that we have to operationalize a complex protocol. Historically, drug development was linear, phase one, phase two, phase three. Now we have many complex trial basket when you have potentially a uh, multiple indications tested with one drug. Umbrella, when you have the opposite, having multiple drugs tested in one indication, platform with everything, adaptive design, the use of synthetic control arms. So the way we conduct uh, trials has changed tremendously, and we have to be able to operationalize it. Last but not least, it's linked to the standoff, actually. We need to reduce the burden on sites and patients. Again, an over-abused term, patient-centricity. We call it at Sanofi, a really patient-driven. 
And I think we have a large initiative, we probably will talk about it later, yep. about the Act for Patient, which is changing the way we do things for the good of the patients, but without forgetting the sites. Nothing is happening uh, without the site, uh, Richard. You said something that a couple of things there I'd just like to pick up on. Um, the role of the regulators, mm -hmm. I'd love to get your take on that because I've seen it through the SCDM, but also in, in recent meetings you've had in the European uh, regulatory agencies and, and parliaments. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get your take on that. You also mentioned kind of the risk-based approach, and I'm sure we'll come on to that more later as well. Yeah. Could you just perhaps talk a little about regulations driving an industry versus us leading, and also what does risk-based mean? Okay, yeah, uh, definitely, and to some extent, I personally believe the regulator are far advanced than we are. They are advocating for different approaches, uh, modernizing clinical research. Uh, the ICH E6 or 2, I believe it's from 2018, yep. when they introduced uh, the risk-based approach, which is really meaning focus on what matters. There's a big confusion in the industry, and it's why probably we have a lack of adoption on the risk-based. It's not about taking a risk, it's about reducing risk by focusing on what matters. So I think on the regulation are clear, and the regulator are asking us to focus on critical data and critical processes. And we had interesting discussion at SCDM with regulator. As an example, when we were, and you were there too, Richard, in Gothenburg uh, in April, we had the chance of having five different regulatory agencies uh, coming and having a discussion with us. And they all constantly mention the need to reduce the burden of the site by not over cleaning, over querying, over collecting data. And they're pushing us to simplify clinical trial as much as possible. It's not just about the GCP uh, ICH E6, but if you really, if we spend time to look at wo what came out last year, the ICH E8, it's really talking about operational feasibility and quality by design. And they insist on the protocol being not just scientifically sound, but oper being operationally feasible as well. And they are pushing, asking us, and it's quite interesting actually that we are falling behind the regulation. If you read what they advocate, if I project myself and probably you do the same on the technology side, how much change I have to do in my software processes to make it happen is, could be scary at times. I think it's interesting because we've, well, we've talked on stage about the need to have science and operational, I'll call it excellence, but operational, whatever it is, in lockstep. And I fear they're pulling it apart at times. And I've placed regulatory and technology in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to shift that analogy. I'm not sure they're in the middle. I think actually it's the wrong picture. I think it's more of a circle. It's more of You're right. we need to work together on things. But um, but I think there's a huge opportunity there and amount of work there. But one of the things I just want to come back to, if you don't mind, is we also had, uh, you know, we saw as an industry the ability to present to not just the regulators but to the governing bodies in Europe recently. Is there anything you would mention? Uh, you know, yeah, no, thanks for reminding me. No, I think we had the great pleasure at SCDM to be invited to the EU Parliament at the beginning of the year to discuss about upcoming regulations on changes primarily in Europe. The European Union is trying to simplify drug development and accelerate uh, access to drugs. Of the specific interest to me is really what they call the European Health Data Space. They really want to fix what we failed fixing in the industry for many yep. years, which is harmonizing electronic medical record, record across Europe. The original intent, and they are clear with that, is uh, we want to make sure that European citizens are getting proper care, meaning that I'm in Spain today. Yeah. If I get sick, the Spanish doctor needs to be able to pull my record, look at them, and treat me without me giving him information about my health. So it's really being able to have your medical record electronically available by any doctor across Europe. This is good for the patients. It's also good for economically speaking. And they gave a good example is we all have seen the war in Ukraine. And when patients left Ukraine and they went to the neighbor countries, they had to be fully rescreened medically to see their condition. And that rescreening 
costed millions, billions, and they want to simplify. But for us, what it means is when they say, once we fix the medical primary care, you, industry, might be in a position to use that wealth of data to accelerate drug development. So why don't we use real data from patients across Europe? You can imagine the vast amount of data that will be available on how could you use it for synthetic control arm, verify safety. And another scary thought we had to us is on the safety side. We have to think a time where the regulator will have more data on our product than us. <laughs> they will have all our safety data across Europe. And you imagine the time it takes, and you know on the CDB and on the visa side how it takes to integrate data, but thinking they would know more than us, it will change the dynamics, the discussions on the safety uh, management uh, overall for the industry. So it's very game changing. It's expect to be uh, voted sometime at the end of the year. As prominent members of SCDM, it's, I think it's a, an incredible thing to lead. But also, I think, as an industry, it's great to see these initiatives are being taken so seriously. No, exactly. And to me, so I've been in data management, as I said, for 30 years. And seeing so much focus on data uh, is amazing. So if we would have looked back 10 years ago, data management was vastly outsourced offshore to foreign countries and not considered a critical function. Now, even having the parliament, the regulator, opening discussion with us, having companies hiring back, seeing the discussion we have today is really encouraging and really uh, a game changing for all of us. So if I may, and within the confines of what you're happy to talk about, but Sanofi have developed this Act for Patients, you mentioned it briefly earlier. Could you perhaps share a little bit about what is Act for Patients? And then would you mind if we just explore what does that mean for data, data management, yeah. patient centricity, site centricity, and so on? No, absolutely, and it will go, I would like to link in that to the topic of today, uh, yeah. EDC3 uh, environment. As a product manager of EDC, <laughs> this is where it's going to get interesting. So <laughs> exactly. No, I think to me, is first and foremost, I really like the term act for patient, and we should uh, all take it at heart. Everything we do is to bring therapy to the market. And as an aside, so again, we've been a long time in data management, but patients are not just anonymous people. So We're all patients in waiting. Exactly. And Personally, the first drug I ever brought to the market was in 94, got used by my own mother. Right. So it's not somebody I don't know, it could be my mother, my sister, my friends, could be us. So we have to take it very seriously. So the act for patient means a lot to me. It means a lot to some of it. It really means simplifying the life of sites and patients. And if I go back to what we said about a lot of patients or patients, Industry talk about patient centricity or vendor. We talk about patient driven. And I'll explain the big difference to me. Is uh, we need to ask the patients what they want, not give them what we believe they want. And if I'm a patient and I can take an example again, me on my 81 years old mother, we would like to be treated differently. If I want to participate in a clinical trial, like many of us after COVID, I work percentage of my time at home. So I would not mind if I participate in a clini clinical trial to be given the opportunity to participate with telemedicine and home nursing. My elderly mother or father would want to see a doctor and to go to the site. The, my dad doesn't know how to use an iPad, does not have a cell phone, so he will not be able to participate in a technology-centric uh, trial. So we need to consider on, it's where the complexity lies. From a technology standpoint, everything is siloed. So I have an EDC system to capture data from site visit. I could have a telemedicine system even at the site or with another vendor capturing telemedicine. I could have a home nurse with their own system capturing data during a patient visit. Um, but as an investigator, I cannot see all of that data in one place. As a patient, if I want to have the data back, how do I get it back from three or four systems? So one of the Sanofi mission is really to see how could we simplify the life of everybody, site patients, and integrate all data into one place. And it's where we came with the idea of 
I would say more traditional EDC free trial, which means that we want all modalities to be enabled. And we want to give the choice to the patient, of course, in the construct of a protocol. If you need to have an MRI, a nurse is not going to bring an MRI on the track. It's not possible via telemedicine, but if it's a simple visit just for vitals, patient can elect to do any way they want. And I think that's where you and I completely agree, this, this yeah. choice. Um, I think we talked yesterday about my vision is I want the patient to literally day by day, hour by hour, decide what's right for them exactly. to continue to participate in the right way. Absolutely. And, and I think you're right. It's a, a very sick patient may want to have that face time. They may also be too sick to leave the bed. They may want a home nurse. They should yeah. have all of those options. And it should just flow because I think what I like about the way you've described it is there's a user journey and a data journey, and they have to come together. And that might be what I add to my analogy with the lockstep. I will go back to the act for patient. Too. Because what it does is, in addition, it's changing the life of sight of the patient, but it's changing our life. So now um, it's going to change. Um, it's why it's exciting being in data management. We're going to impact with the data flow the entire ecosystem and data continuum. And I give one example. It's on uh, on-site monitoring. I strongly believe, and we strongly believe, through the act for patients, that going to the site to do monitoring will dramatically decrease over time. And the example I always give is, uh, if you have uh, electronic consent, you don't need to go to the site to verify the signature of the patient. And the quality is higher because you have that interaction with the investigator. If you collect e-source automatically, or I would say automatically, the SDV goes away. If you do direct shipment of the drug to the patient, the drug reconciliation does not happen at the site anymore. So we are anticipating a massive impact on the site monitoring activities, an increase on centralized data reviews, monitoring, a really shift on role and responsibilities. And I know we had a discussion yesterday about the evolution of the role, and now we slice and dice, but we see really a shift from being on site to being more remote and giving data, getting data uh, digitally from the outset. Uh, which I find an interesting conversation for many, many reasons. But I also remember, I'm going to say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was told data management was done <laughs> because EDC would end data management. Yeah. And fortunately, we, we both stayed and we rode that wave. It feels we're now reversing that conversation. Exactly. And actually, I think data management is at the forefront of everything that's yeah. happening. The Euro European Parliament is a good example. But do you find the role of data managers both within the act for patients, we want to stay on that, but just in general, is now more prominent than ever? It is more prominent than ever and more complex than ever. Yeah. And to some extent, it's not just going to be the data management the way we use it, but it's, it's a new way of managing data. And actually, yeah. if you go back uh, about the whole discussion on this base, is how we treat data. Yeah. So I think on the example is how often these ICH E6 or one was about patient safety and data integrity, so data being processed the right way. Yeah. Or two was patient safety, it never changed, but reliability of the trial result. Yeah. If, so we move from focusing on processing data to what is the value on meaning of the data. Yeah. And we have to change data management function to start thinking about logical things such as, I have data, it's missing, yeah. to I have a complex protocol, I have a complex data flow, how it could impact the patient, the site, and yeah. if I don't design my study correctly, what could be the downstream impact more than ever? It used, it was, it used to be the case, yeah. but not to that level of extent. So I think it's prominent, it's central, but it's way more complex, and it's a big evolution for many of the old-timers that have been in this game for a long time. But exciting. It is exciting. But so let me, let me ask you something here. So under the Act for Patients, you have a vision. You have a vision for bringing that world together. Would you agree with me that there is no solution today? I agree with you, there is no solution And I'm putting today. Viva firmly in that. No, 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 there is no silver bullet, no technology, no process out there that does it all. Absolutely. So what is your approach, again, within the confines of what you have here, in terms of, should we call it experimenting? 
in terms of trying things to learn to then influence further conversation? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, uh, we want to be leading and not being fast following. And what we are clear is we want to be piloting at scale. So we don't want to do one study, learn, wait two years, yep. and see what's happening. Seriously, we want, and I know you don't like the term decentralized, but we want the trial of the future, being patient-driven, to become a default model yep. in the two to three years to come. So by 2025, 2026, we want a traditional EDC-less, patient-driven ecosystem. We know, going back to your question, is we're partnering with a technology provider to develop an ecosystem where patients can participate the way they can in the construct of the protocol. To your point, there is no solution out there. So we are defining the requirements, piloting it, adjusting. We know it's going to take uh, a journey. And where it becomes complicated, and it's where everybody is struggling, is we had very siloed technology, so EPRO, EDC, home nursing, telemedicine, and now we need to bring all of that into one ecosystem, including sensor, wearable, genomic, biomarker, medical images, and so on. So, and we're, our head is still spinning a tiny bit, yep. trying to find what is that silver bullet. So I think we have a couple of solutions we are designing, and we expect to see positive results in the next couple of months. But again, we're going to experiment, learn, and adapt. It's more an agile methodology. Learn, adapt, learn, adapt, learn, adapt. And we hope and we believe by 2025, 2026, uh, with Act for Patients, Sanofi will be ready to have fully uh, digitalized uh, processes for the good of the patients and the investigator. It's going to be an interesting space to watch. And I would like to spend more time on that, but also want to get to the SCDM, which is very important to you as well. Um, but maybe one question, if I may, in terms of traditional EDC, which is obviously a, a specialty. I, I actually think we agree. Um, I don't think there is a role for traditional EDC in a modern ecosystem. And we talked a little bit with a small group. Should we call it EDC going forward? If it is EDC, then it's called EDC. But if we're aspiring to more, is it time to retire? that name because it what worries me and I guess where I'm going with my question is I feel like it anchors thinking to the past mm. as much as actions. No you're uh, and that's uh, you're totally correct. In some extent the term could be conceived as a generic term, electronic data capture. So I capture any data electronically. So EPRO, everything you collect is electronic by nature, but it's very it's very tied closely to a specific system with a specific process managed by a specific department, clinical data management. So I think you're right. If we, I believe we continue keeping the EDC term. It might confuse people. It might not help with the transformation which is required. It might be time to go with something else. That's why yeah. we call it EDC-less yep. uh, environment. So I just need to change all of my marketing campaigns. Definitely. Perfect. OK, <laughs> good. We'll, we'll take that as a note for the future. Um, Thank you for that. Now, I know the SCDM is very important to you, so if you don't mind, I want to take the last 10, 15 minutes to change direction a little bit there. Of course, yeah. Um, would you mind just, we're interested briefly, but in terms of your role, and more importantly, why does this matter to you so much? So, I'm passionate about clinical data management, and I'm passionate about drug development in general. And I think we have been suffering for a tiny bit too long about best practices. And I think the, uh, with the evolution we just talked about, I think we need to have a look into the future and help the industry moving forward. And I think SCDM does that. And it is, a cons I won't say consensus based, but we're bringing the best expert in the industry from the pharma, the vendor, the CRO, biotech, small, large, medium. And we are together defining what the future looks like. And what, I, what it means to me is really a converting, so unifying on a vision, 
to make a difference and collectively working in making it happen, actually. And SCDM, for the last five years, uh, has been working very hard on the journey from what we call clinical data management to clinical data science. The term does not really matter as such, but the evolution which is around uh, what we discuss, the complexification of the protocol, the adoption of risk-based, the decentralization of clinical trial. We have not talked about it, but we know the buzzword yet GPT, but the adoption of AI, and we have a discussion with the regulator at SCDM on the adoption of AI and how we could make it work within drug development, is how all of that is reshaping the future. So now, for the between 2018 and 2022, we really work into what we call the uh, reflection part. Last year, we put a position paper to move from reflection to position. And this year, and you part of it, is all about action. It's really converting what we discuss into a new norm. What is a new CDM norm and how could we guide the industry uh, to a better future? So what it means is really helping and it's really, really about sharing. And I think what I've learned in my career is you have to listen, 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 and listen again. Never assume. And you get more by sharing than the opposite. You get a lot of feedback. You get... Uh, and seek adoption, seek sharing is, I think, what SEDM does well. I, I, I think so. I think the sharing bit for me is, is what really comes through those, those meetings, but also I think the collaboration on the reflection papers. Exactly. You have competitors at every level exactly. coming together, and I think that's very, very good. Yeah. But, it, but it requires leadership like you, like Magda and others. Which exactly. Is, which yeah. is important. Um, and additionally, what SEDM does and does well is the certification program. So we have been creating a certification program for clinical data manager. But what it means to me is the way we, as we discussed, the way we work today cannot continue. So we need the data manager of the future. So we're designing new training and certification program for the data management roles of the future. And that means a lot to me is we can find people understanding complex protocol, uh, all the complex data we have, we discuss sensor, wearable, uh, biomarker, and so on. AI concepts, the new regulation, that easily. So we need to find a body helping all of us collectively to get our staff trained. So it's, it's better to do it through one place than trying to create everything on our own, I would say. So you just sparked a thought there. And, and let me know if this is fair or not, but is it do you then see act for patients and the way you're executing as an extension of what you're talking about at scdm is this the walk the talk scenario absolutely uh, you'd be surprised that some of the slides i share at scdm are the exact same i share at sanofi so i think walking the talk is what matter yeah. you don't get credibility by seeing a in one setting and b on a, another one and i think to me one direction and uh, one only. What I'm excited with the Act for Patients and Office is we have the mean to be able to be probably leading in the space and um, making a big difference, at least on some of those uh, factors. So, but yes, walking the talk is critical and it's what is probably motivating me too is uh, talking is nice, but seeing it in action and making a difference as we certainly acting for the patient, for the good of the industries, uh, it's better. So a couple of questions I'd, I'd like to just make sure we have time for. Mm. Um, I want to do the future of clinical trials first, and then perhaps we'll come and ask what else people should be doing. Maybe we'll do it in that order. But in terms of the future of clinical trials, one thing we haven't touched on, which I'd like you to do is, we define the five Vs as mm. part of it. And it feels to me like if you're going to talk about the future of data management, we have to talk about volume, velocity. But there was a word you didn't use, but you touched on earlier, which was veracity. And I'm trying to think, when you talk about risk-based, when you talk about veracity was never in my vocabulary as a data manager in 1994. It wasn't allowed. How do you see the transition in the context of that, and what challenges does it bring to clinical data science and data management? Good question. And by the way, for the record, Richard in invented the five V's <laughs> so on the idea of the five V's. And really, uh, yes, and you're right. And I divide them in two. And I'll go back to the veracity. You have the 
volume variety and velocity, which is the way we collect and the way we have a lot more data coming much faster with diverse formats. So that how the data flow to me the veracity is more or less ensuring we have a proof we know where the data is coming from. It's really ensuring the lineage of the data. It's more about the it could be related to things like audit trail, but really having the right uh, credential identifications and ensuring that the data is from its point of inception to consumption totally traceable. And it was easy when it was additionally. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have multiple data sources, some generated by the patients, uh, entered into one device, copied into another, a device destroyed, how do you include, how we ensure the veracity and the end-to-end -end lineage of that data is very complex. And but to me, the value is as important. And if I go back to data management in the past, I wouldn't say we did not care about the value, but we did not focus about the value. We assumed once the study would look, that the value will be realized by the st statistical analysis, and it will end up in a submission package and being approved. But now we have to think prior to the uh, lock of the database that is a value there, and am I going to have surprise when I lock the database? So in the context we are on today, and I will give, it's always an example I give, is uh, we collect more data by, the, by this source. And most of the data we collect, like in ePro, imaging, labs, is not uh, alterable. We cannot change it. So if you don't collect it right from the inception, you can't correct after the fact. So we are moving away from being reactive to being proactive. And the example I give to people as a mindset shift on the data management is about missing data. So when you, today, we enter data into the ECRS, and we have an edit check firing if data is missing, or in simple, easy. So if data is missing, then edit check. So, but for some of the other variables, we, e source, we cannot. So we have to anticipate, and what we're thinking or doing is trying to predict what missing data could be at the end of the study, even before collecting all data. So we can act on the uh, process, on technology, before we reach that high level of missing data. And it's really changing the mindset of data management, what we call cryptological thinking to critical thinking, and really changing the edit check into more uh, predictive yeah. algorithm, and different ways of uh, using data, I would say like that. You're embracing allowable tolerances rather than saying it must yeah. be. Um, you shared a number yesterday which had a, about the number of edit checks that never fire. It was a fairly high number, should yeah. I say. Do you think that comes into this as well? It's effort for reward and the value is based on it. And it sparks something we have not touched, is really the avoidable complexities versus unavoidable complexities. But I'll, I'll answer your question. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have observed in many of the studies, so we program thousands of edit check tools. And it is not uncommon to see that half of them not even firing once. So we go through the programming of all of them, but they don't fire. It'll be easier. And then we have to get to the root cause of why half of them are not firing. And simplifying the process is what I call avoidable complexity. Because yeah. we have designed thousands of edit checks just in case of, but that one case never fire. But the unavoidable complexity is uh, what you really have to partner with technology provider uh, to find a solution for so adaptive design. And you talked about it today during your presentation about the uh, easing uh, ECRF design. But if you have an adaptive design and you want to change your protocol as the outcome of an interim analysis or data review, you cannot wait for 12 weeks to go through a protocol amendment on ECRF change to go live. So you cannot pause. So you want to do, you do adaptive to accelerate, but you're limited by technology because you have to pause, change control of your EDC, IV, or EPRO, and so on. So we need to find ways to manage that unavoidable complexity, which is by design meant to accelerate drug development. 
Play chat, so. I'm just going to write that down. Can I use that as a segue then to my last, sorry, penultimate question for you? What else should we be doing as an industry? It sounds like it's walk the talk. It's get out there and experiment, try some things, rethink it. But what else would you? People still have a tendency to think the old way. And we need to f help changing the mentality, the mindset, sorry, and uh, breaking those cycles. I would say that's critical. So you may have then answered my last question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. The final question I'd like to give to everyone is kind of the magic wand scenario. And if I could give you a magic wand and you could just do something today that you can't currently do, and if you could wave, wave the wand and you could send something to Room 101 and commit it to never be done again, are there things that jump to mind that you would like to start or stop doing? I would, I would say, and it could sound wrong, but I think my goal is almost to eliminate what data management does, meaning that data should be coming in one place with quality by design at the outset. We should have one platform where all the data is and have the automated way for the most part to detect pattern and anomaly to the data. We don't need it to be lock ready at any time. So in some extent, if I had a magic wand, I would have one place to collect all the data regardless of their format structure. So ePro, e imaging, biomarker, and so on on one automated way of reviewing the data, detecting fraud, bias, and so data management would only have to oversee data, ensuring the value, and not spending the time on not just data management, but the monitor, the statistician, the medical monitor, so having an automated way of controlling that uh, total development. So at the end, last patient data, push a button, and it goes automatically to submission. That's a pretty good goal. I'll happily come along <laughs> on that journey to try and make that happen. I have to say thank you very much for your time. I know you're a very busy individual. It's been an absolute pleasure to sit and talk to you, as always. Um, for everyone who's been listening and watching, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have talking to Patrick. Uh, I know Patrick makes himself incredibly available to answer questions, so I'm sure if you know him, you can reach out and contact. Otherwise, we'll see you at the SQDM. But if you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll come along and watch some of the other episodes, both recorded in the past and yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>